I often ask people, where do they get their best ideas? Mm. And I'm sure you can guess what the answer is. The shower. In the shower. Yeah. So I say, why don't you just get out of the office and go home and take a shower? Take a shower, yeah. Or why doesn't your office have a shower? Or how many people have ever charged someone for taking a shower? <laughs> because that's really where your best ideas come from. I'm Ron Dror, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to Dan Formosa, Dan consults with companies and organizations worldwide on design and innovation. He was an early proponent of Design for All, also known as Inclusive Design. He lectures internationally on design, research, and the future of design, and is the recipient of numerous design awards. Dan holds degrees in product design, ergonomics, and biomechanics. He co-founded the Masters in Branding program at the School of Visual Arts in New York. He is the host of the very successful YouTube series, Well Equipped, produced by Epicurious for Condé Nast, critiquing in a semi-serious way the design and usability of various kitchen gadgets. He also co-founded 4B Collective, a group focused on design and gender, and recently established Think Act Human to reflect his goal of design for a better world. We talked in the middle of April 2022 and I was looking forward to chatting with Dan when I watched his hilarious and informative product review videos he's done with Epicurious, where he takes a kitchen gadget and critiques every aspect of its design, ergonomics, function. We've also had a short prep call before uh, the interview where it became clear to me what a serious design thinker he is and, and how much we can all learn from him. It was really a joy to talk to Dan and explore his way of seeing the world and his unique approach to design. We talked about growing up in the 1950s in the US and seeing segregation and the opposite of inclusion. The superficial design of the television era, designing to increase perceived value and to increase purchases based on looks. His experience designing on a computer in the 70s designing kitchen gadgets, the need for multidisciplinary thinking, ergonomics, psychology, and other fields of knowledge. What makes a good designer? The importance of asking questions and being uncomfortable. We talk about a connection of design and religious studies, meditation and mindfulness as tools for a designer. We talk about design and inclusion, the 4B Collective, gender and design, the model of collective versus agency, and the difference between a process-based approach versus a knowledge-based approach in design. We talk about qualitative versus quantitative metrics and the death of the brand. Talking to Dan really gave me a sense of the evolution of design over the decades, something that I've been aware of in a fragmentary way only. It's great to see that there's been and continues to be significant evolution in how designers think of themselves and are perceived by others. As someone who loves great processes and methodologies, I was also intrigued and challenged by his suggestion that we emphasize knowledge-based design, and that the designer as a, as a professional with domain-specific knowledge in addition to general design skills and principles. This conversation with Dan is one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, designers, makers, authors, entrepreneurs, and investors who are working to change our world for the better in some meaningful way. So follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe. And now let's jump right in with Dan Formosa. All right. I'm sitting here across the screen from Dan Formosa. Dan, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. And so 
for the longest time, we used to ask this COVID question of, you know, how are you doing? You know, what was your experience? And now there's so much happening in the world. Maybe COVID is kind of waning down, you know, so I, I'm kind of changing this question now. Um, my question to you is, what's it like to be you these days? Well, it's been hectic around here. I've got uh, three children. We have twins mm-hmm. that are just coming up on, twin girls just coming up on, one year old uh, later this month, and then a two and a half year old boy, Zane, who is just a terror, but he is, he's great. He's really funny. He repeats everything we say, whether he knows what it means or not. So he's, he's really, he's entertaining nice. uh, in his own way. Design wise, because I do a lot of research, hands-on research since COVID uh, mm-hmm. broke out, there's not a whole lot of personal contact going on with usability studies especially in the medical field. It's very cautious in that area. So mm-hmm. a lot of it has been online and it's been working surprisingly well. I mean, there's nothing like being with someone to get that sort of like person-to-person contact. But mm-hmm. I would say that the online versions of what I'm doing, has uh, they have their advantages. Yeah. Yeah, we found the same thing too. I, I, I used to be a fanatic for like, I have to be there with the client. Uh, we have to fly. We have to, you know, with the users. And and now we do so much on Zoom and it works very well. So like you said, surprisingly well. And, and so we have a way that our listeners already know to kind of get us into the conversation by understanding the guest a little bit better. And so my question to you is, what's something you learned in childhood or early in life that still drives or guides you today? You know, I was born in the early 50s, and in the U.S., there's been quite a bit of um, social problems mm. in the U.S. in the 50s. I, I, I used to say there used to be social problems. There's still a lot of social problems in the U.S., mm. but in the 1950s, there was a lot of segregation in the U.S., including the South, especially the South. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it found its way all o- over. So there was a lot of bias or prejudice against certain races. So I grew up at a time when I was uh, you know, coming into my teens, actually a little bit earlier than that, when there had been a lot of movements for equality, racial equality. Mm-hmm. And a lot of demonstrations and just a lot of horrible scenes that you could be witness to as that was taking place. So... I grew up in that era of segregation. Then by the late 60s, there was the women's rights movements, which were Mm -hmm. very prominent in the U.S. Again, equality uh, among gender. And so between equality amongst races and equality amongst gender and the whole 1960s anti-establishment movements that I was, you know, me and many, 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 many many others, all all baby boomers were were part of. uh, I think it really focused my drive for design you know my focus on what design should be about and the point is i think design should be about inclusion Mm. that seems obvious today but when i started designing it was a very elite thing to buy or purchase something that was designed as a matter of fact the word design had this very elite meaning it doesn't have the meaning it had today Mm. it had the meaning that it's going to look good and be a lot more expensive and it may or may not work. Mm. That was, that was the late seventies. And there were plenty of examples to, to bear that out in the, in the, uh, around here in the 1970s. Like the really beautiful, but uncomfortable chairs. Yeah. That's a, an interesting understanding of design that, that a lot of us had to kind of work against in our careers. Yeah. We used to work with companies who said, well, we need to increase this product's perceived value which means artificially make it look better than it actually is in many cases because it was not really well thought out. So the world of design was very superficial. Mm. Yeah, that's funny. So you grew up in New Jersey. And so... Sea caucus. Yeah. And then I think you were born in Jersey City, which I actually lived in Jersey City for, for a little while, many years ago. And so... Yeah. Yeah. T- tell me, you know, how does... A kid from New Jersey decided to become a designer. What was the what was the process of that? Well, uh, Sea Caucus, where I grew up, Jersey yeah. City is right across the river from Manhattan. Yep. 
And Sea Caucus is just on the other side of Hoboken, which is right across the river from Manhattan, mm -hmm. which means we literally, from our window, had a view of Manhattan and the Empire State Building. So have never been far from Manhattan or the mm -hmm. center of, of Manhattan. The earliest memory I have of thinking about design was as we were approaching the Lincoln Tunnel mm -hmm. one day, my father was driving, there was a billboard for a BMW Isetta. Mm. And Isetta is probably the most bizarre car you've seen. It has a door in the front. It looks like it has three wheels, but it actually has four wheels, but the back wheels are have a narrow wheel span than mm. the front wheels. And it's amazingly collectible today, but it was an amazingly dangerous vehicle. But I just <laughs> remember seeing this billboard going into the Lincoln Tunnel. There's a woman exiting the car from a door that opened in the front. That's the amazing. door to the car was literally in the front. It's a remarkable car. I'm just looking at pictures now and I just Googled it. Yeah. It, yeah. And it's tiny. And I was probably six at the time, maybe even younger. And just thinking that's bizarre. You know, <laughs> whose idea was that? You know, what's that nice. about? Nice. And um, I'm sure there are lots and lots of examples since then. But I just remember that I said a post and thinking, well, what? the hell is that? And I probably didn't say what the hell is that when I was, you know, five or six years old, but uh, it's stuck in my mind. Wow. And it, it looks like BMW released a progenitor or uh, released a, a new generation for the IZ called the Microlino, which looks very slick spaceship like, but also has the front door. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that front door is the best idea in the world. Yeah. Strangely enough, many, many, many years later, I had a house in New Jersey. And a next door neighbor moved in and he had a beautiful, beautiful, beautifully restored Isetta. And I'm thinking, wow, how rare is that? That's amazing. So I checked it out. I showed it to me. I'm thinking, wow, this is super rare. Weeks later, though, I looked out my window and the Isetta club was having a meeting. <laughs> so there were six of these in his driveway, all beautifully restored. Uh, I haven't seen one since, but they are really hard to find, uh, yeah. really hard to see. But yeah, that's a very, very early memory of design entering my, my, my brain. And, and so I, I heard the story of, which, which is actually quite common uh, between our designer guests, is like you, you really liked both science and art and you were kind of wondering where to go uh, with that. So is that, um, so how did it come about that like from being good at both of these things that you, you ended up studying design? I was in a high school that had a really good science department and chemistry department, and I was good at math. You know, I was pretty good, I should say, in math class. And coming out of high school, or at least when I was starting to think, well, where do I go now? What, what, where do I start applying to schools? I'm thinking, should I go to an art school? Because I was super interested in that as well. Mm. And, or should I go to engineering? And it was at the last minute that one of my advisors, I think it was my art teacher that said, maybe you should think about design as a career, you know, industrial design. And I said, great, what's that? And I looked into it and pulled a portfolio together because the design program I went to at Syracuse University was based in an art school as many design programs are. Yeah. And I pulled a portfolio together and sneaked in, right? I got in, I got accepted, and I went to uh, get a design degree. I was very interested in designing for people and understanding how products related to the body. And so much of what I was doing had some sort of ergonomic tack to it. I was mm -hmm. always thinking, well, the product's nice, but what about the rest of the body that has to use the product? So I would try very hard, not just do sketches of products, but sketches of products that had a hand in it, in the sketch, mm. you know, or I tried very hard to mm. get bodies inside the photographs of my products, because that is the purpose of the product. And that is definitely something that needs to be considered. Mm. That also sounds obvious, but not everyone was doing that. Yeah. The other thing I did is I signed up for a computer graphics class, which was actually not had nothing to do with the design program at Syracuse, absolutely nothing to do. And graphics in the late 1970s on a computer basically didn't exist. So it was super, super crude. But I did take this very high level. I know it was a graduate level course, which I just 
I was in there with a lot of science majors and I just wasn't doing that well in the course, but I was super interested. So, and this is the late seventies. I came into the design department one day with this very crude sketch of a wireframe of a plate and a bowl, which was our project. Let's design a plate and a bowl because yeah. we were looking at ceramics as the project. And so I was able to draw a line like the cross section and I was able to spin it 360 degrees. So I had a wireframe mm. of this bowl and plate and cup. And I came into the design department, said, well, here's my design for a bowl and plate, blah, blah, blah. And I was ostracized. It was the most evil thing I could have done. It <laughs> was seen as I was, I, was, I was a traitor. What are you doing? How are you going to design something on a computer? Do that by hand. It was just uh, the reaction was so negative that I would dare to use a computer to design something that that was the last time I came, came into the design department with any attempt at designing anything. Mm. So one of the things that is, is very obvious today, so I, I was looking at your Epicurious videos and you, you seem to, you know, and you, you kind of evaluate these and, and play with them. And then you do all sorts of little experiments with them. But one of them, I, you put some oil on your left hand to see if you can still grasp it and, and you seem to take a lot of joy in the design process and in kind of not in tearing things apart, but kind of breaking things apart to understand them and then thinking about how it fits with the larger system and the body. And was this always there from a young age or is this like did this joy kind of develop over the years? How do you think about this joy of design? I always like tinkering with things and I always like thinking of how things could be different or better. Hmm. The... Epicurious series that I'm now hosting, uh, yeah. probably two and a half years into it, maybe close to three years into it, started when I got an email, out of the blue email from someone at Epicurious saying, would you be interested in coming in and critiquing some kitchen gadgets for us, mm. you know, design wise, critique some kitchen gadgets and I actually thought it was an odd request. And I Googled Epicurious, you know, <laughs> to make sure I knew who they were and Waited for a couple of days and thinking, I don't know, but it was summer and I'm thinking, well, maybe I should just get out of here and, you know, get out and do something. Maybe it's interesting. I can meet the Epicurious people, which is a you know division of Condé Nast. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of hesitated, but said, oh, okay, I'll come in and see what's going on. And we did this video that did exceptionally well in terms of the number of views. I should say shockingly mm. well. I was surprised how many people watched it. I right. think that initial video is now more than 7 million views. Wow. And it was a fun thing to do. But the premise is that the Epicurious team would find these very bizarre kitchen gadgets, just these very, very odd things. Mm. You know, the more odd, the better. And they would kind of spring them on me to try and it was fun to do. I mean, it was funny and funny thing to do. Yeah. I mentioned early on, as we were talking about the video, I said, you know, well, one of the things I do sometimes is uh, if I'm working with design teams or even for myself, we put soap on your hands and mm -hmm. use your opposite hands to use the product because it'll quickly point out places where you can improve something. Mm -hmm. Because one slippery is what you're going to find in the kitchen anyway. In a very, very crude way, it simulates having some strength problems with your hand or dexterity problems with your hand and using your opposite hand, mm. which for me would be my left hand, also points out some issues that you may not notice with your right hand. At least it exaggerates those issues. And it's an uh, interesting technique for just a quick, quick, quick personal study. That's not the mm. way you really do usability study, but as you're designing something. And because it was Epicurious, the soap turned into oil no. because we're in the kitchen. And you wouldn't do that with a prototype, with your precious prototype. Soap mm. is easier to clean up with your precious prototype. You wouldn't want to use oil. On the series now, I think we're up to 20 something, maybe close to 30 videos, more than 40 million views, which shocks yeah. me because the whole thing is just improvised. It's like, you know, it's, it seems like, like that many people are just tuned in to, to home movies. You know, yeah. so, there's so much fun to shoot, but it does feel like I'm just doing a home movie yeah. because it's so improvised. And every episode, maybe even every product, 
I consider designing for a wide range of people. Mm. So I talk about how you need to consider a spectrum of people, mm. not the average, but you need to exp uh, to consider everyone. Yeah. I think that's, um, yeah, that's definitely part of the interest here. And it's good to have design celebrities, des uh, designer celebrities. I think that the reason people are attracted to it is this just this mindset of why is it done like this? We all use products. Why is it made like this? Could it be better? Have you thought about, you know, these different things? And you make it so quick and easy to start thinking about it that I think it's almost like a glimpse into the designer's mind, which I think is probably what attracts people into it. I think people think that products pop out of machines. Mm. I don't think people think about the fact that there are people behind every product you see. I do think that when something is very well designed or somebody really likes something, they think about the people behind it. But mm. that's probably a very small percentage of the products that they buy or the products that they own or the services that they use. If it works great, someone is probably saying, oh, those people are really thinking. But mm -hmm. the 99% of the products that are around your house or your office or your environments, I think people just think they pop out of machines. Yeah. So I think the fact that I'm pointing out that somebody made this decision to design this thing this way, and usually it's some funny gadget or some gadget that just is not well thought out at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of critiquing of like, what were they thinking when they designed this or who designed this or... Have these people ever been in a kitchen before in their lives? Or? Yeah, like the turkey carver that looks like a chainsaw was one of my favorite. That's a, that's a crazy one. So I, this is, um, you know, a, a lot of our listeners are designers or in kind of related fields. So I love to ask this question because I think it can go pretty deep. What is design? I have a very wide angle definition of design. And I'm mm. finding that you know, I have found over the years that not everyone has that wide angle definition, mm. but it really is the a purposeful design of the entire experience of the things that we are creating or making or designing or modifying. Mm. So start to finish design needs to be considered from its inception to its final disposal. So mm -hmm. yeah, I have a very wide angle view and Maybe the best description is really what's the effect, not mm. what's the thing, what's the result of that thing? Mm. What does that thing do in terms to enable you or make you happy or it's just to improve your quality of life? Yeah. I find that not everyone has that wide angle description of design. They kind of pocket it in a very specific area. Like, here's the sign, here's this, here's that. I've heard this definition, I think, from, I, I think it was from ID or from the School of Design at Stanford, where they say engineering is in charge of the possible, you know, the business people are in charge of the viable, you as a designer are in charge of the desirable. Yeah, well, I think so, because that may not be in the radar scope of those other groups. Mm. Well, maybe the marketing group would think that because, you know, they want people to buy it. Maybe not the engineering group, but I, I wouldn't pigeonhole uh, design just in terms of being desirable hmm. because, you know, for instance, we, I work a lot in pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical devices or medical devices. They're not necessarily desirable, but they have to be used. So what I try to do is make them as easy to use as possible yeah. because what we want people to do is take their medications and take them correctly and be okay with taking them and encourage them to take them because the dropout rate for pharmaceuticals is huge mm. and it's not good for anyone's health when that happens. So desirable would be a bit of a funny word, but maybe increase usability. And when I say usability, increase ease of use, but also increase performance. Mm. You said before the design the way people used to view it was very superficial. Can you elaborate, like, what is the superficial view of design versus a deeper view of design? There are a lot of early examples of great design. But when I was in design school in the 1970s, there were also great examples of terrible design. Hmm. So what was very, very typical was for a company to engineer something, tool something, get the whole 
mechanism working, and then at the very end, ask the designers to make it look good. Now, I blame television because in the 1950s, when companies were able to advertise their products on television, whether they had a new and improved product or not, they had to show something that looked new and improved. Mm. So marketing became very powerful in the 1950s, you know, the Mad Men era. Mm. And they were very devious in many ways about what they would claim about their products, but they wanted it to look good on television because you can now advertise to the entire country at the same time and show the product. What you saw was a lot of plastic chrome or wood grain mm. and rather unusable products, but also very, very, very little, if maybe zero, design research. Mm. So the design team's role, the designer's role, was to sit in their studio and sketch, either using markers or pastels or whatever their medium was. And they would sketch things to make it look good and the designers were very good at putting specular highlights, you know, making things look shiny mm. or making it look like there's a little sparkle to the products. <laughs> uh, very good at mimicking wood grain, even though that wood grain is going to be actually plastic. Uh, there was a lot of superficial work going on. Mm. Because of that, I think there was pretty much the boomer generation come out of colleges in the late 70s and early 80s started to think about design research, like maybe the design team should actually get to know the people who are using these products. And maybe design has a bigger purpose than making a toaster look pretty. Maybe design can be used to improve quality of life. Mm. And so it was with that, that I think me and many, many, many other designers started creating the methodologies for doing design research. Let's get the designers out of the studio Mm. and out into the field. Even when I was in college and and long after, design research would be about looking stuff up in the library, like looking up the size of people from these anthropometric guides. And designers would say, and I'd see portfolios sometimes from designers who'd say, here's my research. And their research consisted of these reference guides of body sizes. Or maybe they would take a piece of clay and squeeze it and say, here's the shape of my hand when I squeeze it. And that was the extent of their research. So design research really took a while to take off. And not every company in the world was saying, great, we have design research now because the marketing groups were calling the shots and they were very used to calling the shots. And they were very used to saying, You don't need to talk to consumers. We'll tell you what the consumers want. Mm. Yeah. And so you continue from studying design uh, to then doing a master's and and a PG in ergonomics and biomechanics and and studying the body. And and so what made you enter these fields from, from a position of design? Assuming that you still wanted to be a designer, what made you kind of go that that route? I was designing a lot of products that people had to touch and interface with and hold and manipulate. Hmm. And I would be probably from a more amateur level understanding how the body works or how the hand works or how the arm works or the rest of the body as well, mechanically, Hmm. and decided that maybe I should just keep moving forward and get a degree in biomechanics. So I really get into understanding how bodies work and bones work, et cetera. And I went from there to a PhD. Now, and it certainly helps to, if you're going to design a product to understand how the hand works. Mm-hmm. I find a lot of designers and engineers don't understand how the hand works. So as a result, I give a lot of workshops to companies, whether it's medical companies or sports equipment companies or any number of design groups in just basic biomechanics, sometimes just in basic physics Hmm. of you know how gravity works so right. that you understand the possibilities and also the limitations of usability i speak a lot of design schools you know universities and design schools and even now the design schools will say well we're different we're all about understanding people 
Mm. And I will say, well, do you have courses in ergonomics or biomechanics so that people understand the body? Mm. And the answer would be no. And right. I say, well, how about psychology? Do you have courses in psychology or you know, cognitive abilities so you understand how people think or what their mind's about? And they would say, no, we don't require psychology. We don't require ergonomics. I say, well, if you're not about the body and you're not about the brain, what part of the person are you about? And it usually ends up with blank stares. Hmm. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. Yeah. So you, you mentioned to me there's uh, you know, there's all these fields that we could, you know, expand into. So obviously psychology and anatomy. I think, you know, I, as someone who studied uh, religious studies, for instance, I think religions are fertile grounds for, for study for designers because they design everything. They design time. They design community. They design processes. They design uh, institutions even the right type of people. So the, there's actually theories in, um, in religious studies that the purpose of a religion is to manufacture a certain type of person that the society needs. You know, uh, there's so many different areas. So have you seen any efforts to kind of expand and broaden the kind, kind of the, the, the other types of knowledge that could, could go into a design mindset? I think the more design gets into people's heads, that is a topic and that it is a thing that it is a thing. Hmm. I think people in many, many different fields like religion, I would think or hope are thinking, well, maybe there's a way to design this. Now hmm. you've got to say too, that it already has been designed. I mean, a lot yeah. of that has been well worked out over the centuries, yeah. but I think there's probably a lot of room for some new or different thinking about it. For sure. So yeah, I think that I think uh, religion is a good topic. I think movements are a good topic. Mm. I think topics like again may get it may get back to design and behavior, but energy conservation. How do we change people's minds or change people's behavior so they are more efficient? How do we change people's behavior so they do take their medications? How do we change behavior so that they consider others, not just themselves? Mm. A lot of social issues still to be addressed. So what would you say makes a good designer? What are the core skills that someone needs to, uh, skills, mindsets, tools, wh whatever, you, however you want to categorize it, that makes someone uh, a good designer or a potentially good designer? One of the things that makes a good designer is the ability to ask good questions hmm. and not to take anything at face value and take things that sometimes we've been used to all our lives and say, well, why is it like that? Hmm. So uh, very often I think design needs to be about the why question, not what. So ask a really good why question and ask very innocent why questions without any bias or prejudice. So once that is done and you get to some really good why questions, that really opens up a whole lot of thinking of what are the possibilities that this could be different, that our lives or someone's life could be different. Like, why are we doing it this way? Why does this even exist? Hmm. You know, a new project comes in or a new opportunity for a product, and you may want to say, why is this even something to address? There are so many other important topics out there that possibly we could be addressed. And I could go on for an hour about this. And I have, <laughs> yeah, you know, in, in giving our workshops and seminars is how bad we are at asking questions because what we want to do is give answers. And the reason we want to give answers is because we have been trained since our first, well, even since birth, but, you know, 
first entry into school at kindergarten, we've always been rewarded for answers. Mm. We don't get rewarded for asking questions. And as time goes on, you know, as we grow up, questions tend to be a pain in the butt. Or if we're in school, we don't understand something. I'm not raising my hand. You know, right. I hope someone else does because I don't get it, but I don't want to look stupid. Hmm. So questions can make us look stupid. And what I've noticed once that's been a bit of a revelation for me is that every meeting I'm in, I see a lot of people trying to come up with answers as opposed to come up with questions. So you sit in a conference room with a bunch of people talking about something and everyone has the solution. You know, everyone has the answer. Very, very few people will have questions or good questions. So we do have an adversity to questions. And I think being a good designer would uh, entail the opposite. Mm. Now you, you also talk about feeling comfortable with uncertainty, with the unknown. So may, maybe that's also part of that. That feeling that you need to be comfortable with to ask a question is to acknowledge that you don't know, is to, is to, is to sit with it. People are too content to be comfortable. People are not that good or feel uneasy about being uncomfortable, you know, entire teams, entire companies. But you can't innovate or you can't be even interesting as a product or service unless you push the boundaries a bit. And pushing those boundaries can make you or your team very uncomfortable. Mm. So what you got to do first is be okay with that. Another topic along those lines is that if you are working within a budget and a schedule, you're probably not being innovative. You know, you can't innovate on a budget and a schedule. If you could, you would innovate all the time and you'd be an amazing person. Mm. You also have to realize that working within a budget and a schedule also has its limitations. Of course, you want to push the boundaries as much as possible, but just keep in mind that you are working within lots of constraints and innovation doesn't like constraints. Yeah. And so a lot of these skills feel extremely soft, like the ability to ask questions, to sit with uncertainty, to imagine, you know, new solutions, etc. You know, can these things, do you think, be taught? Have you seen them successfully taught? It's possible, but I think designers have to get away from their desks in order to do that and visit the world once in a while, meaning get out of the desk and just go somewhere else to come up with concepts. I have told design groups or oh, designers, why don't you just go home and work on this project because they're working on something for the kitchen, for example. I said, well, why don't you just go to your kitchen and sit there and design it? And they won't do it. They're more comfortable coming into an office and sitting at a desk in front of their computer designing a kitchen implement. Yeah. And that doesn't make sense to me, you know, mm. but there's more comfort, I guess. There's a little uneasy, like you're supposed to be sitting in your chair in the office, just like you were supposed to be sitting in your chair at school. So there is this behavior that is based on voices in the back of the head, I think, that are saying you need to do this, you need to be here, you need to think this way, you need to be constrained, you need to think not out of the box, but within the box, you know, draw within the lines. Hmm. In order to encourage, to encourage someone to be creative, I think a good way to do that is to think about small successes at a time. Hmm. You know, everybody likes success. And if you can point someone to something that could be creative, but with the path of least resistance or the highest level of success, the highest probability of success, then I think that's a good baby step to mm -hmm. get people to try something further the next time and further the next time and eventually become comfortable with the fact that they are uncomfortable, but confident that they are at least on the right path or at least confident that being uncomfortable is part of their job. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of my, one of my experiences, I, I, I've experienced, for instance, meditation really making me a better designer uh, for a couple of reasons. One is mindfulness and kind of being more attentive to small details. 
Another is less reactivity. So really being able to be in an uncomfortable situation without having to already formulate the perfect answer to it in that moment, being able to stay with the question and suddenly noticing that you're taking something for granted and maybe asking why. That's something that sometimes happens to me in meditation. I guess it's another place you could go off of the out of the office and into an ashram or something uh, or a place where you can... Uh, uh, you can work on the way you see the world or the way you experience each moment. One of the things, this is what reminded me of something. When I give these workshops in design and innovation and you know the way we work, critiquing or thinking about the way we work, I often ask people, where do they get their best ideas? Hmm. And I'm sure you can guess what the answer is. The shower in the shower yeah so i say why don't you just get out of the office and go home and take a shower take a shower yeah or why why how many people have ever charged someone for taking a shower <laughs> because that's really where your best ideas come from um and you know get a lot of giggles or stares but no our, our system you know the design world is based on getting paid or charging on an hourly basis hmm. while you are sitting at your desk or in the office or out doing research. But yeah, very rarely do you charge someone for taking a shower. As a result, I try very hard not to think about my value or value of designers as an hourly thing. Hmm. Because that sets up a certain mindset. And that problem's so big, it is almost unapproachable. But the entire system is set up to base your value on the amount of time that you're working, not on the quality of ideas or not on the result and not on the outcome, mm. but literally on the amount of time you spent on a project. If you're in that system, if you're working within that system, it is extremely limiting. It limits the definition of the field. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Picasso who said, one, one great artist, I'm, I'm terrible with remembering quote, quotes, but he said, um, you know, may take me a moment to do, but I spend my whole life getting to the point of being able to do it. So I think the next time someone yeah. asks me for an hourly quote, I'd be like, are you sure? Because I can give you an hourly quote, but I'm going to charge you for every hour, every problem that I solved along the way to get me to the point where I can solve your problem. That might not be so... Uh, uh, economical for them. No, that makes a lot of sense. I also, I also always think of Picasso have, as having spent a lot of time in bars in Spain or mm. Barcelona yeah. because he seemed to understand people. At least that's my perception or that's my vision of Picasso. He got out in the world and he you know, sat at bars and talked to people and then went home and painted or sculpted, you know, because I've done a lot of work in Barcelona. I was working with the design office that had, that had a, a group in Barcelona. And I've got to say, getting out of the office and going down to a cafe and drinking wine and talking about design is so much more, it gives you so much more freedom than sitting in the office talking about design or talking mm -hmm. about the project. The conversations are so much different once you get out of the office or once you get out of that environment. Nice. So I want to talk a little bit about the 4B Collective, which seems to be doing a lot of interesting work. To, do you want to tell us what that is and, and kind of what's, uh, what's emerging there? 4B Collective, I, I co-founded with the thought that we need to understand gender. So one of the frontiers that we can pursue is thinking about gender and the fact that males and females are wired quite differently and think mm -hmm. differently. And in looking, really examining the opportunity to design better products and services that consider females in a more conducive way, first maybe look internally at the way we design things. Mm -hmm. Because the engineering profession and the design profession really emanated, at least from the 1930s, as a male based profession. So design, industrial design and engineering were both heavily populated by males, not females, mm. which means the way we design things and the way we think about things and the way we think about projects is really based on the way males would do it. 
So the way we have meetings right. or the way we structure a product is more of a hunt activity than a gather activity. Mm. And as a result, you see an, a, an equal gender balance in engineering schools mm. and you know 50-50 gender balance in design schools, but not in the profession. So females get into those professions and somehow they feel uncomfortable, it's not right, or they drop out or they go into some other field, a uh, design-related field that may be more female-friendly. Mm. But and I don't think it's an intentional thing by males. I just think the culture that evolved because it was so heavily populated by males, the culture that evolved in engineering and design is very male biased and not very conducive to the way females would prefer to work. Let me say before I lose the thought is that often when I talk about gender, I talk, it's very black and white. I talk about males and females. Females think this the way, males think that way. Mm. It's really a spectrum of thought, but it's so much easier just to talk in terms of males and females. But I don't mean to be so binary about it. But the way we design something is in itself a design. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah. So why don't we think about the way we design things and see if there are other ways to design something or think about design. And so that's what 4B Collective is about. 4B stands for 4 billion females in the world. Hmm. And it is a collective, not an agency with a fixed number of people. So it's a network of people who know a lot of things and have passion for things. And when a project or an opportunity comes in, we assemble a team of people who would be really good at it. I really resonate with this idea of a collective. We are an agency, but I kind of feel like behind the scenes, we're more of a collective. And so what made you call it or my, what made you kind of think of it as a collective? What's the thinking behind that? For the longest time, I've been hearing people who work at companies and who are hiring design groups say they were really disappointed, partly because they did not get the team that they expected. Hmm. One of the things I hear is that there was one team that sold the project, but a totally different team was working on the project. Hmm. Now, this gets back to a couple of thoughts about the entire design profession. Is that initially when design research started emerging as a thing, again, when I was just coming into the world of design, we were proposing the idea that we should actually be doing our own design research. You know, we used to call it market research. That didn't work. We called it design research. And now, you know, it sounds like something that we own. Mm. But we were saying to companies, what we need to do is we need to meet people and consumers or the people who are going to use these products. We need to observe them. We need to do our own research. We need to do this early in the process. Let's do some initial research. Let's come through some ideation, which means let's make a lot of concepts. Let's, let's mock things up. Let's do simulations with those products very early on. Let's try many different things on and on. Mm. So that became a process that was being sold to companies or being delivered to companies throughout the 1980s and 1990s. And every design group around that time had their own version, own unique version of how they're going to approach design for this company and change the way they think about design. Mm -hmm. Every unique version was exactly the same. If you went from one design agency to the other, their unique version was just like the other design group's unique version. Yeah. So it wasn't that unique, but everyone was, was selling this process of design. One thing that emerged out of that is the idea that design is a process. And what emerged out of that, which, which is a little tricky with agencies, is that people get assigned. We need one of these people. We need one of these people. We need one of these mm. people because that's what falls into our process. Mm. So with an agency, the cost of a design project is rather high because so many people need to get involved. But also from the agency's point of view, it's rather easy to staff because you know a design agency's goal is to keep everyone billable. Mm -hmm. So... We need someone to fill this process slot and we need someone to fill this process slot. So by turning it into a process, it's very easy to staff because you can, it's kind of like building a house. You could put anybody on that part of the, uh, on that part of the project, on that yeah. slot of the project. You just planned on it like a spreadsheet and you say, we need someone here, someone here, someone. Yeah, exactly. They're interchangeable. 
As a result, you see a lot of people with not a whole lot of experience or background or even passion for a project being assigned to a project. So mm -hmm. what you tend to get on a project is not the most appropriate people. What you tend to get are the most available people. Right. Like who's not busy in our office next week because we've got to fill these slots. Right. And so that works to a point if you think about the process, but it doesn't add a whole lot of knowledge or experience to the field of design. So one of the things I push for is whether we can move from a process-based approach, which is ingrained in design's culture at this point, to a knowledge-based approach. Mm. Can we actually put people on projects who know things? Mm. One of the other tricks with designers or design agencies is once you get really good at something, you become a manager, not the actual designer. Right. So you move away from design. The better you get at design or the more experience you have, the less design work you do. Yeah. We've, we've run into this. So I've worked in agencies. And when, when I started this company, I, I decided to go a very separate way because I think a lot of what you're, you're saying comes from the wrong model of growth, where growth entails doing more projects, always more and more projects, and then you need more and more people. And then people have to become interchangeable because you have to be able to, you know, all your existing people are busy and then you get a new project and you you have to say yes to it and i i knew having having been part of one of the fastest growing agencies uh in america knew that i wasn't digging that model of growth because people are not interchangeable and so thinking about growth differently is may, maybe having more impact maybe charging more maybe doing a better job right Th these different models of growth that are not industrial uh, when it comes to people solving hard problems. Yeah, and you know, charging more actually comes down to maybe charging the same, but doing it more efficiently for the people who are working on the project. Right. right. So, you know, should we hire, should we hire us like a junior designer for five days or should we hire you for two days? Right. Because you may have the same level of outcome or the same number of ideas, or at least should you, should there be more, uh, mentoring in the world of design because there's not a lot of transfer of knowledge. Mm. You know, you get people on a design project who didn't even see, have no knowledge of the project that the client saw that they thought would be a good reason to hire this agency. Mm. The other thing I've seen is that let's say you're working on a project for five, you're scheduled for a project for five days. And so you start on Monday, you come out with a great idea on Wednesday you're done, right? Yeah. You've done it. I've got it. What do you do Thursday and Friday? You work on it. You yeah. massage it. You color it. You know, you sketch it. You do minor variations. Mm. So even if you're able to do something quicker, you play out those five days. Yeah. So you're not actually more efficient because you are not scheduled to finish until Friday. Yeah. So it sets up, it sets up an, an odd mind, mindset. Mm. So yeah, I think there are some things that in the profession itself can be redesigned. And I think the collective model breaks that because you can actually find people who know stuff and assemble teams based on that. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's great. So I want to ask about quantitative versus qualitative and how you approach this idea of metrics in a design process of, of you know, kind of KPIs. In terms of design and metrics, you know, one of the problems I think we have with design is there are no metrics in design. And because of that, one, we don't express our value because we can't quantify it. Secondly, we don't learn that much because we can't quantify it. So one of the things I noticed very early on is that by measuring things, we can be very effective in understanding things. And I did it, you know, with a background in biomechanics and think about like fit and comfort of products. You know, you want to understand people's bodies and you want to measure things and understand the spectrum of sizes that you need to accommodate, et cetera. Hmm. So very, very early on in some of my very first design projects, I was doing some very unusual quantitative studies on body sizes, but also in perception and measuring perceptions. Like, because if you want to 
find out if something is comfortable, what you have to do is ask someone mm. and maybe ask them to rate the level of comfort. You know, if you're measuring body sizes, then you could just use some calibers and measure body sizes and see what the variation is mm. or, you know, see how something's going to physically fit the body. But you also may ask how comfortable it is because comfortable brings in perception. If you combine the two, that's pretty interesting because now you see if I make this change here, look how the perception changed here. So very early on, I was into quantifying and found two things. One, the idea of doing something a little more cutting edge was a lot more acceptable because we had a lot of backup mm. that we can go in that direction. We can push the envelope because look what the results are. Mm. Also because we're pushing the envelope in a direction that was based on the evidence that we saw. So now we can get a lot more innovative and a lot more creative. I guess the other thing I should say is that there's a sense that quantifying is not creative. Quantifying is super creative. Mm. So you can get a lot more creative if you quantify things. So you can get a lot more effective in convincing people that this is the way to go. And the other thing is you learn things. You learn about perception, you learn about body sizes, and you learn about variability. And you learn about a whole lot of things that you may not have noticed if you were not quantifying things or even if you were just doing some qualitative research. It's very interesting. I, I, I had a group just last week. I had a group of students, grad students at the branding program that I, I helped create and teach in. It's not a design program, but one of the groups was charged with doing some research, qualitative research. And they ended up doing their interviews with a lot of consumers, but they also ended up asking them questions on a Likert scale, like a one to seven scale. Mm. And I really thought their interview, this group specifically was gonna be the qualitative research group. Mm. And their entire presentation was based on the quantitative uh, results. Mm. I said, what about the qualitative part? Cause that's what I thought you were gonna be doing. And they said oh, it was really hard to do the qualitative part. We really, you know, we couldn't pull it together. We couldn't get the results out of the qualitative. It was too much to read, too much to talk about. The quantitative mm. really summed it up much better. And mm. it is what we heard, but somehow focusing or communicating through the quantitative made a lot more sense to them. That being said, there are very few metrics in, in design. And I think that's a problem, especially in a world where companies more and more and more are data driven. Yeah. And data is being sent at exponential rates up to the cloud. And I think a lot of people don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So I have uh, two final questions for you. The next one is about branding. And you, you said, you famously said that branding is dead and then was given a master's in branding program to, uh, to lead. And so theoretically now, you know, there's a way to bring the, the term back in some way. So what's your view on branding? Why are, why are brands dead? You know, what can we do to keep them alive or to, or to keep them functional? A very long time ago, more than 10 years ago, I gave a talk in San Diego at an AIGA conference, which was full of, you know, people in graphics design and brand communications. And part of my talk was the fact that branding is dead, which initially made me a lot of friends in that room. But my point was, and I came to win their hearts, the point is that we're not basing our decisions or opinions of brands based on what the brands tell us. We're basing our opinions based on what brands do mm. and what people tell us brands do. So we're, we're buying a product. We don't go to the company's website necessarily to see what they say about it. We go to the reviews or discussion groups or YouTube, or we get our information from so many other places, mm -hmm. which means the product or the service really needs to be the best representative of the brand. We can't mm -hmm. rely on what companies say about themselves because we don't have to anymore. There was a time when companies owned the media that was pre-internet. Mm. And so all our information was coming from the media, whether it was from the company itself, or maybe there was a magazine article or some sort of consumer review article. But now the media is owned by us. We are talking to each other. 
So that is a whole different world. That means the products themselves need to deliver on what they promise to be. They also need to mold themselves into something that is desirable to people, that is attractive to people. Hmm. So brands are not about the product. It's really brands are about what they stand for. It has a big influence on what we want to buy and who we want to align with in terms of companies or brands. Yeah. And that was the point. After giving that talk, that branding is dead. A few weeks later, I got a call from Debbie Millman. And Debbie said, uh, we're talking about starting a branding program, a master's degree in branding at the School of Visual Arts. Would you like to help form the program? And I said, did you hear my talk? <laughs> and she said, yeah. So that's why that was the idea. So the idea was talking about how branding is really being disrupted. You know, branding as we knew it has been disrupted. This goes back, you know, more than 10 years now with the program. Um, that's, that's amazing. This makes me think of, um, uh, there's a skit from Bo Burnham. I don't know if you know the, the comedian Bo Burnham, uh, but he came out, he has a Netflix special where he's a social brand consultant. And his, his, uh, one of the lines is, the question is no longer, do you want to buy wheat thins, for example? The question is now, will you support wheat thins in the fight against Lyme disease? Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what, that, that's what it's about. You know, think about the brands that you like. They have, you know, they, they have a secondary mission, maybe a higher mission yeah. in many cases. And it could just be they, they want like the, you know, they're making audio equipment. They want the best sound in the world, you know, but right. you know, there's somebody passionate about something, yeah. but it could be some sort of, you know, social good. Like we're giving eyeglasses away to people who need them around the world or whatever yeah. that cause may be. Yeah. And yeah, so you want to buy into it. The opposite is you don't want to buy into evil corporations. Yeah, for sure. So we have this closing question, which I like to ask, and, you know, listeners already kind of know it. So in his TED Talk, the philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. A lecture being informational and dry and you kind of make up your own mind. And a sermon, which he, he longs for the days of sermons, was a passionate plea to change someone's life or to change the world in some way. And so my question to you is, if you had a chance to give a short sermon, what would it be? My sermon, and I think I do this a lot, would cover a whole lot of topics, but mainly it's about being inclusive and thinking about everybody. That doesn't mean designing the same thing for everybody, but think about design in its power to change our lives and improve our lives and to solve problems and to make our world a better place and think wide about it. Don't think about limitations, but think about the power of design and where it is now, but more importantly, where we can take it. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan, so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I really enjoy talking with you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Remake is produced by myself and Regina Rothstein. Research and editing by Louis Brady. And audio engineering by Greg Cocoveos. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also just makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. We're a global strategic design speed agency aimed at improving outcomes through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone, and see you next week on Remake.